the hour grows late. The last surviving member of the Society for Creative Anachronism. The final of the sword and sorcery originals who defined the form, who helped gave it name, who shaped it and made it more than its humble origins. This is Outlaw Bookseller donning the surplus of chaos to review the citadel of forgotten myths, probably the last Elric novel. You know we are the veterans of a thousand psychic wars. You can hear the footsteps falling as the winds of limbo roar. It's a voice, it's a plangent voice, an eloquent voice, a wintry voice, a summery voice, a voice which contains all things that has told all stories, all manner of tale has dripped from that pen. Michael Moorcock has returned with what will probably be the final Alric novel, The Citadel of Forgotten Myths published today, the 6th of November 2022. This is Outlaw Bookseller Stephen E. Andrews and I've just finished reading this and we're going to have a chat about it and I'll let you know what I think. So first to begin with the book itself, UK Golanx edition. I do like the jacket illustration. Um, I'm going to descend away from the poetry a moment just to express something simple and yeah very handsome. I do like that rendering of Elric. I'm not always fond of renderings of Elric. My favourite remains the Achilles one and on the spine green gilt embossed there. Very very nice indeed and I've wrapped the jacket already as you can see. We begin with a problem um, and this is from the text on the jacket and it says set between the first and second book in the Elric saga. Okay well if it's set between the first and second book that means it's set between Elric of Melnibane aka the Dreaming City in its shorter version and Fortress of the Pearl. So as soon as you start to read though you realise this is not the case. Do the publishers mean that it's set between the first and second of the current omnibus editions? Again no I would say. Some sources are citing that the story takes place between, I think it's the Flamebringers, let me just see, between Kings in Darkness and the Caravan of Forgotten Dreams, which its original title was the Flamebringers, and I prefer Caravan of Forgotten Dreams, but of course Caravan of Forgotten Dreams sounds very like Citadel of Forgotten Myths. Maybe that title will be dropped from future omnibuses. It's already been dropped from the Gallery Saga one, but it's a shame because I've always loved that title. Um, and as I've said, I don't think any omnibus edition is yet definitive and with the publication of this obviously it's not. But the story seems to take place late in the Elra chronology, um, round about the time of Bane of the Black Sword, interspersed within that possibly and before Stormbringer, the climax. And it's been a long time since we've had an Elric novel and it's also very different to the Elric novels which we enjoyed in the 80s and 90s. Being a purist, I do prefer the original Elric novels and short stories, the 15,000 word novellas that were fixed up and then the novels later written to sort of bookend them. Obviously Stormbringer was the first Elric novel but it's the last in the internal chronology and Elric of Melnibane was written to fill in the gaps from before the original tales so that there was a conventional narrative for conventional readers to follow. Having said that, I really like Elric of Melnibane. I've read it many times and I absolutely love it. So. This is more in the vein of those earlier books, yet it contains the stylistic flourishes and the sophistication that we came to see in the 1980s when the Elric books issued then came to intersect with Von Beck, particularly The Revenge of the Rose. And there's also some of the psychedelic floridness that we associate with the Moonbeam Roads. Now psychedelia has always been there in Moorcock, we know that. It comes from the early influence of Edgar Rice Burroughs, who's obviously always prevalent as one of Moorcock's influences, and that is very welcome. So this is both a traditional Elric tale and a contemporary one showing the uh, maturity of style and the wit, the elegance, and the forward motion that Moorcock has always showed in his writing. So it's both old and new. So that's absolutely marvellous because what we want from fantasy, what we expect, what it gives us is the thrill of the anachronistic through the supernatural. And at the same time, can we refresh 
the old tropes, the old symbols, the dragon, the sword, what have you, which go back way, way, way into Western culture from the early mythology of Beowulf, the Norse, what have you. And Moorcock draws in other things as well, of course, from other cultures. So it is a fantastic mixture of the two things. So the chronology is somewhat suspect on the publishers, so we'll see what happens. So maybe in the future we'll get another definitive omnibus. We must remember that Mike is getting on in years, sadly, and this may be the last Elric novel. And that brings me to the question, with a Dorian Hawkmoon, with a Coram, they don't appear in this book. Um, there are hints of Coram in its colours, and there is a mention of Camp Brass. I'm going to try and avoid spoilers, but as we all know with Moorcock, it's about the friction of recognition, as one critic said. It's about the repetition of motifs, of the echoes across the multiverse, of the different events, characters, symbols, and all the business that goes with that wonderful melange of one great work. Moorcock hasn't written lots of books, he's writing one book, and that's something that everybody has to understand. And this is where issues come up where people say about the reading order, forget the reading order, plunge in, immerse yourself and move outward because you will swim around in this pool and you will see different fish each time you plunge into it. That is the reality of it. So the structure. It says in the rear of the book that some of it appeared previously in magazines, and I'm just going to read exactly what it says for you. Parts of the novel, now substantially revised, appeared in Weird Tales, number 349, um, back in 2008, and also in Swords and Dark Magic, the new sword and sorcery in 2010. Now, I don't have those anthologies. I've not looked at them. Um, I suspect it's the first two parts of the book, because if you turn to the title page, um, beyond the full title page and we go to this contents page here book one book two and book three and you see the book one page one naturally book two begins on page 55 and book three on page 111 the book is um, 316 pages long so you have two shorter novellas in the style of the initial Elric stories from the 1960s, the 15,000 word classics that we know and love. And then you have a longer narrative later on. So my suspicion is, and I'm sure somebody will correct me straight away on this because they would have read those anthologies, that it's the first two stories in here. And in the first one, Elric pursues his weird into the far world. And it's a wonderful opening with um, Moon Glum, and our Moon Glum is back, which is fantastic because we all love Moon Glum, based as he is apparently on Barrington J. Bailey, the great neglected British SF writer, the father of dark British space opera, who you should all embrace. If you're reading fantasy, you should read Bailey, even though he's not a fantasy writer. If you're reading space opera and you're a younger reader, you must engage with Bailey. And Moon Glum is back, the short, red haired, ready, velvet coated, double sworded, the Sancho Panza figure um, beside Elric. In book one, our anti-heroes are shipborne, headed for the edge of the world. There is much talk of cosmology, of the nature of Elric's cosmology and world, and they head towards an edge to the land below, to the world below, pursued by a pirate vessel, which is described with Moorcock's characteristic elan, elegance and verve as a black shape that makes one ripple inside with the silk of Elric's own sort of bodily garb. And it really is wonderful stuff. You're born straight away into the musculature, the tissue, the sinew of the body of the eternal champion. And it is like going back in time. It's absolutely wonderful. There is a fantastic moment where something supernatural is conjured and the shadow of Robert E. Howard. It isn't just looming large, it's emerging from the shadows and it's almost open homage. And it's simple and beautiful and powerful and eldritch and it's a wonderful start. And we soon realise that the Queen of the Swords, Zionbarg, is invoked in the book and this becomes a major theme. But what of Arioch? So the opening flurry is magnificent and enjoyable and full of all the terseness and colour that we come to expect. And I absolutely loved it. And I think anybody who loves the Elric books, particularly the early ones, will love the first section. And the characters are beautifully drawn. Um, Elric's aunt is in it, interestingly enough. So it's another look into the royal blood of Mel Nibine, which is fascinating as ever, as Moorcock puts on extra detail that we haven't seen from previous chronicles. And also further on in the book, 
the author of the Chronicle of the Black Sword, though it's not actually called that in this one, is revealed, and we find it who there is. So I'm not going to tell you, but you love it. It's just a little aside. And this is a book with many little asides, as more Cox books always are, which have such enormous friction of meaning as they ripple out through the multiverse. While the first book contains the tale which shows the ship bearing Elric and Moonglum to the world below, the second tale is set entirely there and shows us a short quest which Elric and Moonglum go upon in search of something which will succour Elric's failing health, as ever dependent on Stormbringer and on herbs which give him life. And in this case, Ariok is disappointingly absent and Elric is very reticent about accessing Stormbringer because of all the problems that the sword has brought to him. So he hears of something else which may help, but it's yet another crutch. Elric is, for all his sophistication and wit and irony and skill, an eternal adolescent. He is always looking for crutches. We saw this in the shape of the Dead Gods book and all the plot, plot coupons that we've seen in other Elric stories, where he always searching through his weird to try and discover something to shore him up. And Elric scarcely has time to think about what he really wants and where he's really going. He is tossed by fate. He is surrendered to the laws of chaos. And he never really settles into what he wants to do. And that's there at the beginning of Arak and Malnibane. He's a philosopher king. He's a king no longer. His fate has forced him out of the conflict with Wyakun. And in the second story, he goes in search of something which at least will keep his physicality together in the struggle and the quest for what is to come. Because as ever, Elric is looking always for something. He's looking for answers. He seeks the secret of his ancestry. Um, this is quite interesting because it goes into areas we haven't seen in any depth before about Melnibanean ancestry and the role of dragons. And you're going to love that. That's absolutely fantastic. So there's two really muscular, short, sharp novellas to begin this book. And then it moves on to the main feature. The main part of the book, the third section, which is the longest part, which begins on page 111 and lasts for just over 200 pages, is, to my way of thinking, not my favourite part of the narrative. I preferred the first two. I did very much want a traditional Elric. The third part is traditional Elric, but it does have a lot of the stylistic flourishes you'd expect from the 80s and from the Moonbeam Road books. But again, Moorcock has matured even more. The style is even smoother and even more beautiful and more elegant. It's even more psychedelic and inventive and throughout we get the nods to other characters other times other places all aspects of the eternal champion in the multiverse of course the whispering swarm comes in the eldrin come in if the first two novellas in the book are resonant rhymes more traditional in keeping with what we love about early elric the third part of the book the longer part which is just over 200 pages long is more of an assonant rhyme it's more sophisticated in its tone, the writing is even smoother, it's less muscular, it is longer. In my view it's a little bit too long, but it does depend on what you think about the style and how much you like the style. It ends with a fairly psychedelic climax, some of which I personally felt could have been edited. I'm not going to give you any spoilers. But it is very, very involving. New characters are introduced. We discover an alternate possibility to Mal Nibine in the world below, which is very colourful. A very fascinating sidebar character um, called Orlando Funk appears, who you know, reminds us of many of the other sidebar characters who pop up across the multiverse. And at times he appears Scots, sometimes not. And there are the usual sort of dilations of time and space that you expect across such a saga. Meeting a new paramour, who appears to be strangely related in a way, Elric makes his way to a city which is possibly that plains version of Tainalorn, or possibly not, and discovers an idyllic place. And there are flashes of Morris and Dunsany, the, you know, Edison, the original sort of fantasy writers, the ones who predate Burroughs and the sword and sorcery writers who began to flourish with Robert E. Howard in the 1930s and the Society for Creative Anachronism. So we're seeing that sort of wonderful literary English part of Moorcock coming through and the language is very beautiful. And the thing with Mike is he's able to sort of mesh the contemporary and the modern and the archaic together without it ever jarring. You put it. Without giving any more of the game away, to sum up, this is classic Elric, but with a sort of surety of style that we have seen before, 
but again it's evolved Mike's writing has evolved and always moves forward and it's kind of mature in a subtle sort of way and yet in the same breath I would say that it entertains and seeks to do nothing but entertain but there's always sort of subtext and undercurrents there's lots about politics and economics but it's expressed as part of the narrative and it's subtle and sometimes it's difficult to say exactly what might be might be referring to but you know he does that a lot in the Cornelius books as well and it is maybe more of a case of him making general moral points rather than specific sort of topical ones which can date a book very very badly so I won't really say any more about the detail of the plot. If you like classic sword and sorcery, you love it. If you're a Moorcock fan, you love it. I personally felt, as I say, that I think it was a bit too long, particularly the third part. I think there could have been some trimming there. So I'd have liked to have seen a little bit more fleetness in the climax. But there's plenty in it for the fan to enjoy. For the new reader, well, it's difficult because I can't imagine being a new <laughs> reader of Moorcock. And I guess I discovered him at a point where it was far, far easier. And I read the Jerry Cornelius novels and the Elric novels first, which I still think are the best ones to read first. So if you're new to Elric, maybe you should sort of get the omnibus, the first omnibus at least under your belt, and you can then fit this in. It'll come together. But, you know, it's very, very welcome to see a return to one of our most loved characters late in a writer's career. Um, and it's in the shops now from Golanx. I'm not sure who publishes it in the USA. Um, maybe more criticism to come once we've all had a chance to read it. But that is the welcome return of Elric, the Sorcerer King of Malnibane in the Citadel of Forgotten Myths. Bye for now.